thanks for having me to talk about accelerating Spark with Rapids for cost savings. Uh, as uh, Chester was mentioning earlier, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. I'll also check in and see if anybody has any questions along the way. So just to set the stage, um, and in 2022, there was an IDC a study that looked at data generation over time. And it found that uh, a compound annual growth rate of data generation of greater than 21%. And they forecasted that in the year 2026, 221 zettabytes of data will be generated in that year alone. And a zettabyte is a very large number, just to try to grasp that. An average Android phone has 100 gigabytes of storage. So you'd need 10 billion Android phones for a single zettabyte of data. And the world is going to generate 221 times that amount of data in just a few years. So this becomes challenging because um, much of the data that enterprises collect, about 80% of the data that's collected is unstructured. and they we that that presents a huge challenge in data processing uh and if you just think about one percent of the data that's produced this year running through etl processing that requires hundreds of millions of compute nodes to process the data so as data folks this is going to keep us busy for quite a long time so how do we deal with this data growth there are a couple of different ways uh, with a fixed amount of computing capacity, as data grows, it takes longer to compute that amount of data. So we could accept that the amount of time to process data is going to grow as the amount of data grows. Or we could throw more hardware at the problem. And uh, we know that data frameworks have evolved from single node machines to massively parallel compute engines. And we can scale those clusters up with additional nodes at increased cost to reduce latency. Um, so that's, that's the price of doing that. Alternatively, we can reduce the fidelity of our data processing. Uh, for example, when preparing data models for processing or for training, we can sample data. We can use smart algorithms like hyperloglog -log or hash, uh, um, uh, uh, sampling algorithms to, to uh, be smart about sampling data, but this can save cost but reduce accuracy. So over time, we've dealt with data growth in different ways. There has been Hadoop in the 2000s, which introduced MapReduce and allowed data to scale to large clusters with relatively inexpensive nodes. There was Spark in the 2010s, which expanded the reach of data processing to many more users because it has such a easy to use interface or set different interfaces like SQL, uh, Python, uh, Java, Scala that uh, broadened the audience of data processing and allowed data processing to scale. When we talk about the data growth going forward in this decade, we think that there is going to continue to be a jump in the amount of compute processing required for the, this data. And one way to approach this problem is to use GPUs with Spark. So I want to talk about using Rapid Spark to accelerate compute for existing data while addressing the cost savings problem. And the way I, I want to start is to talk about a benchmark called TPCDS. At NVIDIA, we, uh, we use this benchmark. We call it NDS, or the NVIDIA Decision Support Benchmark. Uh, this is our adaptation of TPCDS. And TPCDS, for those not familiar, is the Transaction Processing Council Decision su Support Benchmark, which has about 100 queries. It 
represents a business that has an online retail and brick and mortar, uh, sorry, uh, catalog sales. And you can scale up and scale down the benchmark to whatever you need. Um, we make only very minor modifications to the benchmark and just to be able to run in Spark, we publish the way that we run the benchmark in GitHub so that you can replicate this. We run this at scale factor 3000 or three terabytes. Uh, we are encoding the CSV data that originally gets generated for the benchmark to parquet and we partition it and we store data in uh, in a uh, object store uh, when we're running the benchmark. Uh, more specifically, our benchmark is running on a Spark cluster in Google Cloud using Google Cloud's data proc distribution of Spark. We use data proc because, as an example, because the virtual machines in data proc can have GPUs added to them, so we can do a one-to-one -one comparison between the same machines with and without GPUs. So in this benchmark, we're using four nodes, uh, four worker nodes with 32 vCores, 208 gigs of memory each, and two NVMEs per node running with Spark 3.3 on Yarn. And we run with and without two GPUs per node. The only difference being that we are adding our Spark plugin jar to the GPU cluster. So GPUs do add a cost to the cluster. So we're adding two T4s per node, which is 35 cents per hour per GPU. So we're increasing the cost of the cluster by 37%. And the question is, is this worth it? Uh, and before I answer that question, I also want to be transparent about the configuration. We're trying to give the CPU nodes and the CPU cluster the best possible configuration. There are a few additional GPU-specific configs that we add, and those are highlighted there. But we don't want to go overboard in configuring and tuning Spark. We don't want to make this an exercise in needing to know the exact uh, special configs to make things fast. We want this to work out of the box for people. When we do a power run in NDS, which means we run all 100 queries uh, at uh, one after the other in the CPU and GPU clusters, we see that the CPU cluster takes 176 minutes versus 31 minutes for the GPU nodes. This gives us an average 5.7x speed up across all queries. And um, this is running on a release that we did in uh, February. Uh, so this is what we call our 2302 release. From a, from a performance perspective alone, this is a good outcome. But remember I said that we're increasing the cost by 37% for the cluster when we do one-to-one -one comparison. When we look at the time taken though, uh, the GPU cluster running at 31 minutes costs $7.20 versus the CPU cluster, which costs $32.52. So with the speed up, we get both the acceleration and the cost savings. So what's even more interesting is that from a power draw perspective, this is also good for the environment. When we hold the node count constant at four nodes and compare the results, the, we have a 5x better throughput per watt that's um, that's used in the cluster. Um, if we were to hold uh, the performance constant and say we need a CPU cluster that can match the speed up of the GPU cluster, we'd have to increase the CPU cluster size. And when we do that, we need about 20 nodes to get the same performance. And even with that faster time, it would be about twice as much power to get the same result. Uh, and 
in we do have some users who have seen or, or who have these real constraints in their on-premises cluster where they have reached the limit of power usage in their data center. And in order to get more out of their data center, they are adding GPUs, but removing CPUs, uh, CPU nodes, but adding GPUs to existing nodes so that they can conserve power in their cluster. So if you are thinking about speed up, if you're thinking about manage, managing a budget, if you're thinking about um, the constraints of an on-premises cluster in terms of power, uh, all of these are things that the Rapid Spark Accelerator can, uh, can address. To take a look at a more um, concrete use case, last year we worked with a team at a retailer and they had a job that was running to optimize their digital store shelves or what products they should be showing people on their e-commerce website and mobile app. And they were re-ranking the content of the digital store shelves on an hourly basis. And they said, you know, this while, while this helps us make money, running this job also costs a lot of money. So what can we do to, to what, what can we do about that? Um, so the job they were running um, is represented by the bar in blue, where they had, again, on Google data, data proc, they were running 40 nodes of the N2 HiMem32. And it was taking them about 45 minutes to 50 minutes to get this job done so that they could refresh the content of their site on an hourly basis. They took that cluster and they, uh, they actually took the N N1 instead of N2 node. They added two T4s per node. They ran this job and they saw that they got 2x speed up of this job. Uh, and they did, they ran with different cluster configurations. They said, okay, if, if we cut the cluster in half, we get 1.6x speed up. And if we cut it into 10 nodes, a quarter, they saw a 20% speed up. When they looked at the cost savings, they saw that they, with the 40 nodes, because of the speed up, they were able to get a 40% cost benefit. And with the 20 nodes, they got a 60% cost benefit. And with 70 nodes based on the speed up, they were able to get, sorry, 10, 10 nodes based on the speed up, they were able to get a 70% cost benefit. They ultimately went with the 70% cost benefit because the job was meeting SLAs with a quarter of the nodes, but with two GPUs per node. And they see a cost savings of in the hundreds of thousands of dollars per year for this one job. So this retailer is continuing to explore other jobs that they can use GPUs with uh, so that they can get either cost savings or speed up depending on the use case that they're going for. Um, now I talked a lot about Dataproc our solution works across many different Spark distributions, and we have integrated it with different clouds and different environments. Um, in so I, I'm showing here the same benchmark, the TPCDS Scale Factor 3000, running on different clouds and using different node types in different environments. If we look at the AWS EMR 6.9, we use the, uh, at the time, the M6 GD 8X large was the, uh, the M6 uh, uh, Graviton node was the, the latest Graviton node from Amazon. It's, uh, the Graviton nodes are relatively cheaper than the x86 architecture. And in this case, we used eight of those nodes and compared that to two G4DN 12X large nodes, 
which are basically uh, the T4, four T4s per node, although in this case using the x86 architecture on a node. And we saw a 42% cost savings in that case. Um, in uh, using Databricks Photon, we measured, uh, again, using the Graviton node, uh, this time comparing to a A10 GPU, uh, we saw a 39% cost savings. And to be clear, on the Databricks cost calculation, we are using Photon and we're in accounting for both the instance cost and, and the Databricks DBU pricing for Photon in the cost. Uh, so we're, we're getting a cost savings here. Uh, um, and, and the same thing on Azure, we uh, benchmarked and we saw 34% cost savings for this benchmark. In this case, using the standard E16 DSV4 instance type for the CPU and the NC8 AST4 V3 for the GPU. You'll notice there are cost differences across the different clouds. That's due to a number of different factors. Different clouds have different types of environments, different uh, hardware. The GPU does well at, when we can keep it as busy as possible. In other words, when we are not IO bound and different clouds have different types of networking and different environments. We also see that we do well when we are able to have relatively fast local disks, preferably SSDs, so that the shuffle operation can be as fast as possible and spill to disk can be as fast as possible. Uh, and one of the things I mentioned earlier, earlier about Dataproc being a good environment to test on is we could do an apples to apples comparison of the exact same node types in the AWS and Azure environments the GPU nodes have different characteristics for disk and networking than the CPU nodes. They're generally less performant than the equivalent CPU node. Um, I think in that case, the cloud providers are looking to provide a, a, a relatively good cost for the GPU node overall. So uh, that's another reason why there's some cost differences. And I mentioned we are available in different environments and with different Spark distributions. Uh, Amazon integrates Rapid Spark with EMR. Cloudera integrates with CDP. We work with uh, Databricks to create a integrated solution that works with Databricks. Uh, we work closely with Dataproc for uh, similarly. Um, we also have worked with Azure in the past. They have integrated an older version of our plugin and they'll soon upgrade to a newer version. And of course we integrate with the uh, open source Apache Spark. The plugin works with Yarn, Standalone and Kubernetes. And uh, that's because of the, the uh, ability to schedule a GPU with those schedule, schedulers. Um, I'll pause there for a moment and see if there are any questions. Yeah, you can ask questions directly or just uh, type on the chat windows. Samir, maybe uh, you can continue and then they can okay. ask later. Uh, great. Um, so uh, now I've talked about the performance and cost. Uh, let me talk a little bit about how this works. So most of you are familiar with Spark and um, the architecture of Spark. Uh, what we are doing is we are leveraging a functionality in Spark 3.x that enables resource aware scheduling. Uh, this is a, a feature that uh, we helped contribute to. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we can schedule a resource in Yarn, Kubernetes, and Standalone. Um, 
So tasks scheduled on these worker nodes can be aware of any accelerator resource like an FPGA or a GPU on these different types of nodes. Um, I'll also mention that Spark 3 enabled a SQL plugin to allow for column-based processing, which is more efficient when reading a subset of columnar data rather than having to read a whole row. And ETL data sets can be thousands of columns, so it makes it a lot more efficient when we can focus only on the columns of interest to speed up our processing. So what does it mean that we can enable uh, task scheduling on GPUs? So Spark3.x doesn't inherently run ETL batch code on a GPU. Uh, and just because we can schedule there uh, doesn't mean that a user knows how to write code for a GPU. This is where the RapidSpark plugin comes in. Users can continue to write applications in the APIs that they're familiar with, and Spark continues to provide the distribution and scale up computing power. Um, the Rapids Accelerator provides transparency for applications to run on GPUs. With So we can enable that GPU acceleration and in, in cooperation with Spark's core engine. Uh, so let me try to build that picture for you. Uh, again, from a user perspective, the user continues to write code against Spark in their standard data frame or SQL API um, using, again, PySpark, uh, R, Scala, Java. And there's no, there's no change from a user perspective. When running, the user needs to configure Spark to run with the Rapid Spark plugin jar. And that what that jar is going to do is it's going to look at the physical plan. And if we find a operation that we have enabled to run on the GPU for that particular data type, we'll call out to our Rapid Spark jar to run that operation or that node on the GPU. We do that by creating Java bindings into an open source library called Rapids QDF or the CUDA data frame library. That library is a C++ library built on top of CUDA that <clears throat> runs data frame operations on CUDA. If the operation has not been enabled <coughs> for that data type to run the GPU, we'll seamlessly fall back to the existing Spark CPU application. <coughs> Excuse me. So we also have a accelerated shuffle and we, we have this shuffle um, that can call out to an open source library called UCX. This is a unified communications framework library. So if RDMA is available or if NVLink to connect multiple GPUs is available, we can directly communicate between uh, GPUs using this UCX library. And we have another version of the Rapid Spark Shuffle that takes advantage of existing CPU cores to overlap I.O. and GPU processing. I want to emphasize that from a user perspective, no query changes are required. We just add the Rapid Spark jar to the class path uh, using the Spark plugins config. <clears throat> it's the same SQL and data frame code compatible with exist existing APIs, and we fall back for users. So we try to come to the user where they are and not have the user have to make changes to their code. 
to diagram what's happening underneath, Spark is taking a query, and, and this is either, uh, this is an example of a, a data frame query or a, uh, a SQL query, it takes that data frame operation. Spark creates a logical plan. From that logical plan, uh, it tries to optimize, and then it creates a physical plan. From that physical plan, the rapid Spark plugin jar intercepts the plan um, almost as, as late as we can. We create a GPU version of that physical plan. We operate on that GPU version of the plan. We convert the data back to the row format that Spark expects, and then we complete the operation. To, <clears throat> to go into a little more detail um, on that particular query, you can see that there uh, the comparison between the CPU physical plan and the GPU physical plan. So in both cases, we're reading the Parquet file. Uh, we do not need to convert Parquet to row for format because we operate in a columnar fashion on the GPU. We do, <clears throat> in this case, the aggregations. We do a shuffle. Um, we do a shuffle combine. We do a second aggregation stage. We write out the Parquet file, and then we convert data back to the row format for the CPU. And if you, I, I know it's very small, but on the left and the right, you can compare the Spark DAGs, and you can see on the right-hand side, the nodes in the DAG being replaced by CPU operations. So why is the GPU fast? The GPU is fast because we get data level parallelism versus task level parallelism. As I mentioned earlier, we are in a sense IO bound. The more data we can throw at the GPU, the more we can run uh, parallel tasks and complete jobs faster than the CPU. Um, so, that's where the GPU is getting a large advantage over the CPU. So does this solve every problem? Uh, no, we're not gonna claim it solves every single problem. Uh, if there are small amounts of data where you're not gonna get that data level parallelism compared to the CPU, it may not be worth it to move data over the PCIe bus to the GPU to process a small amount of data. If the data is already highly cache coherent, the CPU probably has an advantage. Um, again, from an IO perspective, we want to take, uh, we want to grab as much data as possible, as quickly as possible. So if we're working on a distributed file system that is not that fast, uh, we may not see as many benefits running on the GPU. Um, and one area where we still see a um, uh, challenge is user-defined functions. Uh, we cannot code those for the GPU ahead of time. So uh, UDFs do not run on the GPU. They will fall back. Now that's not to say you may have a GPU and you still may get acceleration with your job because the GPU may be so much faster, but UDFs do not run on the GPU by default. Um, we do have some ways of getting GPUs, uh, UDFs to run on the GPU uh, if, the G if the UDF is fairly straightforward and we can convert it to catalyst operations, we can run on the GPU, um, or if a user is interested, they can rewrite their UDF to run in uh, uh, in rapids, uh, then the, it, we, we can get that UDF running on the GPU. And we have some examples of that uh, in our repository if people are interested. So having said that, there are cases where we can get some pretty amazing speed up. Any high cardinality processing, joins, aggregations, sorts, uh, large windowing operations, we've seen very large speed up. 
Uh, and you can see in the graph here on the right, uh, we've seen up to 20x. Actually, we've seen even beyond 20x speed up in windowing operations, but this is just one example. Uh, complex processing, we do well on. Uh, and interestingly, transcoding, we also do well on. We can do quite well if we're encoding parquet or C or reading CSV. Okay, so <clears throat> how do we know which jobs we wanna focus on when we want to try this on a GPU? Um, because I mentioned it works well for some jobs, it doesn't work as well for other jobs. Um, and we wanna focus on the ones where we'll get the most cost benefit. Uh, we have a set of tools. Uh, we call them our qualification tools, but it's a combination of qualification, profiling, and tuning. So to understand the potential cost savings and acceleration, uh, <clears throat> you can take your existing Spark 2 or Spark 3 event logs and run this Spark Rapids user tools. I'm giving an, ex an example here for Dataproc, but we also work on AWS, EMR, AWS Databricks, and Azure Databricks. Um, this is an example command of taking a set of logs from a cluster and running the qualification tool and getting a list of jobs that may be well suited to run on the GPU. Once you have that and you want to um, get those jobs running on the G GPU, we provide a script that will uh, bootstrap a cluster for you. It'll provide those additional configurations that will enable you to run on the GPU and you can get started uh, running a job there. And finally, uh, once you have the logs from a job that's run on the GPU, uh, you can tune those jobs by running this tune profiling tool uh, on top of the event logs from the jobs that were run on the GPU. The tool is pretty straightforward to download. It's, it, you can pip install the tool and run it. Um, so we try to make it easy for people to get started. Uh, and there's documentation on the, on the pip page as well as pointers to our documentation. The output of the qualification tool comes in the form of text files that show the results of the analysis. And the basic output shows an application name, whether the application is strongly recommended, recommended or not recommended, and an estimated speed up if run on the same cluster shape, but with GPU nodes added and the estimated GPU duration versus the duration in the CPU event log, um, and an estimated savings based on that CSP's retail pricing. So we give an overall, uh, a summary table providing the overall estimated speed up and the estimated cost savings. So we provide an estimated indication of speed up only. Um, these are not guaranteed speed ups. They're directionally what we expect users to see. And the idea is to provide you with some queries that you can start to focus on when you're starting out with the plugin and to see what the potential savings might be. You may want to consider the total cost of ownership of your job by considering the job frequency to see which jobs might give the most cost benefit if they're sped up by the GPU. Um, so if you've got a job that runs every 15 minutes and um, uh, gets a, a, a some amount of cost saving, but you have another job that runs daily and gets another amount, your 15 minute job might be the one to focus on if, if even if it's a slightly less cost saving for an individual job um, because you, you may accumulate savings over the course of time. Um, and we're, we're, we're working to enhance our tooling to infer frequency so we can 
uh, based on what we see in logs so we can recommend uh, accordingly. Uh, in addition to what you see here on the screen, we provide more detailed analyses in other output files, including information about why an application may or may not be well suited to run on the GPU. And um, the output also contains information about execs and expressions that are supported on the GPU, their duration, the speed up factors, and estimated speed up by each stage. We base our estimates um, based on what we see in TPCDS running on the different environments. So that's that's where we derive these speed ups from. And the speed ups are available in our open source repository in our tools repository in case people want to see what we think the speed ups might be for a given exec or uh, expression. We have the same kind of output available in a uh, UI. So in addition to the text files that we output, we also output HTML. Uh, and uh, you can view and navigate through the generated output to get a sense of what jobs might be well suited to the GPU for you. Um, in terms of what's coming up, you know, we continue to work on reliability and performance for our users. Uh, we also see that Delta Lake, Iceberg, and Hoodie are becoming more widely adopted. And we are working to make sure that our read and write operations with these layouts are also GPU accelerated. And I'd love to hear from this group whether you're using any of these formats. Um, they're, they're, we, we see people using all three of them in different environments with Spark Rapids. Um, and it, it seems like no one has a critical mass, but they're all quite popular and they're for, for their own reasons. We're working on ARM support, um, which is important for us. Uh, as NVIDIA is coming out with an ARM chip very soon. Um, but we, we've we already tested and, and our RapidSpark plugin works on ARM. Uh, so we'll, we'll be working on getting a formal release of an ARM jar soon. Um, I mentioned that uh, we our tooling works in different environments. We're just about to release tooling for the Azure Databricks environment. We already work in the Azure and AWS Databricks, AWS EMR, Dataproc, and for on-premises. So that qualification tool works in, in all these environments. Um, and in our upcoming release, we're going to include uh, a file caching capability so that users can turn on and off file caching to get even better performance. This goes beyond just using the GPU, but as I said, we tend to see that people become IO bound and we want to do everything we possibly can to, uh, to, to improve IO for, con uh, for data going to the GPU. Um, I have one last slide, which is uh, for more information. Um, the best place to get started is we've got an, an nvidia.com slash spark page. You can find a lot more information there. Uh, we are an Apache open source project and we have a GitHub repository at nvidia slash spark dash rapids. And we encourage people to open issues or ask a question in the GitHub discussion board. Uh, we've got a lot more detailed documentation about using the plugin in our user docs. And you can always contact us at uh, Spark Rapid Support. So I'm happy to take questions um, from folks and, and thank you for your time. Yeah, that's a great talk. And actually, uh, you know, if uh, for those folks that don't know the Spark Rabbit open source project, this is actually quite helpful. So I, if I put my old hats on, which as the person who in charge of GoPro's data infrastructures and the data pipelines, 
data analytics, I would say, hey, you know, I would like to try this because uh, that probably giving me a lot of savings. Um, so especially the the I can see the uh, uh, what do you call the diagnostic? Uh, what's called the diagnostic tool? What is called tool you're talking about? Uh, the the qualification and profile. Qualification, and yeah, qualification tool. I thought that was very useful. So because uh, I don't need to try it and out, I can just simply run that tool. Say, hey, you know, there's a, a quite a bit of a savings I could do if I do this. And assuming that uh, the bootstrapping part is uh, pretty simple, so I can literally, you know, run the tool and and and, and put there. If it doesn't work for me, and I just just don't do it. So I can see that 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 uh, should be quite easy to do. Uh, at GoPro we're using. That time I was at GoPro, where I'm using Databricks on AWS. So that should give me pretty quick look and see which pipeline I can save. You know how much money and all that stuff. So so I, I felt that it was uh, tried, <laughs> very helpful. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> you know I like to hear uh, folks who online to you know asking your questions. Uh, um, you know, either as I said, so you can unmute yourself or you can direct it on the chat. Hey, uh, Samir, I got a question. This uh, Rajesh. I'm um, a data engineer uh, by profession. I use uh, Spark a lot. So um, I was just wondering, uh, so just looking at the any Spark SQL, right? So can we like um, come to a conclusion whether this can be optimized using the uh, GPU or can we run on the GPU or it should just continue to run on uh, CPU, like you know, uh, from from what I understand, all of those um, joins, uh, we can look at the joins and the cardinality and just try to uh, come to a conclusion whether this can be C GPU optimized. So, so can can we come to the conclusion without running that uh, that tool, that uh, qualification tool, just looking at the SQL query and you know, just uh, making a decision over there? Yeah. So I I I think that if you if you have a job where you know you're operating on a large amount of data and you um, you you have a complex query, doesn't have UDFs, uh, I would say that's a good candidate for running on the GPU. I would encourage you to run the qualification tool though because it does look at everything in the log and make a recommendation. Um, that the reason, you know, when, when uh, we first released this jar, our, my thought was that yes, you could just look at the SQL and say, hey, you know, this this looks good. Let's just try this on the GPU. What we found is that there are organizations that have thousands upon thousands of Spark jobs running, and it's helpful for them to organize their their approach by what they think is going to give them the most benefit, what the tool recommends, and. Uh, and, and, and then approach it from that perspective. So it's more methodical, but there's nothing to stop you from trying the plugin out and, and seeing how it works for you. Well, thanks. So there's a question coming, question coming from UK. Uh, Kimberly asked, uh, what's an example of class, uh, cluster config that would be good to test it out? Um, uh, Kimberly, are you asking, uh, this, the shape of the cluster or the spark configurations for the cluster? Um, I think that if you're talking about the shape of the cluster, we have folks using this on clusters as small as two nodes up to clusters that are hundreds of nodes. Um, and what we generally recommend, regardless of this number of nodes in the cluster, is that you uh, your cluster has decent I/O. I would recommend SSDs and 10 gigabit per second networking as a good starting point for the nodes in the cluster uh, to get the most benefit uh, and. From a GPU perspective, I, I gave examples of the T4 here. We work pretty well on the lower end or inference types of GPUs. Uh, and these days, those are the T4, L4, or A10, or A30 GPUs. 
Uh, we also work well on the larger or the training GPUs. The challenge there will be the cost benefit because those GPUs tend to cost uh, relatively more, especially in the cloud environments, given the demand for those GPUs to do training. Um, if you're asking about the Spark configurations, uh, this is also where the the um, tooling helps that it, the, the bootstrap tool recommends some configurations. And I'll go back to, I'll go back to this slide where I showed the example configs for the NDS benchmark that we ran, um, where we, we didn't change the CPU configs all that much. You do need to be aware of, um, the Spark Task Resource GPU amount um, as a configuration. So this is a Spark configuration that allows you to utilize the GPUs. And we have some documentation about this on our on our site. It's also there in the Apache Spark docs. And then um, the the other configurations to start with are the um, uh, the uh, SQL batch size bytes, which you may want to uh, configure that one. Um, uh, I see that you, you mentioned that you were asking about the number of nodes. So I, I hope I answered that question. And um, yeah. So uh, Samir, I, I got a follow-up question. On, uh, so you mentioned that uh, you need a, a good disk, like SSDs. Mm -hmm. uh, but if most of the data are actually, like for example, uh, on the AWS and it's on the store on S3, are you saying that data have to be on the SSIDs or we have just using No, it? no. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. The we we work really well with the object stores in the cloud environment. So the raw input and output data on the object stores S3, GCS, Azure Blob Store, totally fine. The um what I meant for the local disks is not to use the it is to, is, is the local disks being used for shuffle and spill. I see, I see. I see, I see. Good. Any other questions uh, for people online? Uh, the 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 talk is a rec a recorded. Uh, Samir, can we have the slides shared to the yes. members? Okay. So yeah. I'll. Right. Oh, there is uh, something else. Is uh, it's another question from Rajesh? He said, "Is uh, is it available on AWS Glue?" Um, we have not tried it with AWS Glue. I believe if AWS Glue underneath is using AWS EMR, it is possible to enable the Rapid Spark plugin. Hey, uh, if you could... go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so that yeah, that's what I'd say. Okay, so if there's no more questions, then I would like to thank the speaker, Samir, for giving great talks from the high level to the very technical details. And this would be very helpful. Uh, thank you for the people who are attending and uh, we'll share the slides and the recording uh, after the event. Thank you so much. We have another event this evening on the streaming part of it. So if you're interested in that, you can join at 5 p.m.